welcome to the Enliven Beverage Deal Podcast, where we're all about saving and making you money by taking both the guesswork and the legwork out of your beverage partnership and by leveling the playing field when it comes to negotiating your beverage contracts. I'm your host, Tim Harms. We've got a great show for you today. Stay tuned. Well, today we have part two of a two-part interview on the difference between pouring rights and a beverage marketing agreement with uh, Rob Wade, the food service practice leader at Enliven, a great, great source of knowledge. Uh, Definitely some tips, practical tips that you can put to use today in this interview. But if you haven't caught the last episode, part one, you're going to want to do that. It lays a lot of the foundation and groundwork. So go ahead re-listen to that or listen to it if you haven't yet uh, before you dive into this one. For those who have listened, just a really quick refresher on the difference between pouring rights and a beverage marketing agreement. Both are terms that are used when a beverage company partners with an organization, uh, but they mean slightly different things. A pouring rights agreement actually refers to the right of the beverage company uh, to be the, the beverage served at a property. Uh, So if you go to a sporting event and they have a a pouring rights agreement, when you go to the concession stand, it's only going to be that company's products being served. Whereas a beverage marketing agreement is much more focused outside of the property, pairing uh, the property's brand with the beverage company's brand outside. So so in that same example, a sports stadium, it's it's actually when you go into a retail environment, a a Walmart or a Walgreens, and you see the beverage company. Uh, brand next to that sports brand. Um, That's what a beverage marketing agreement is all about in traditional terms. But Rob was really outlining some some, uh, really interesting ways to think about it. If done right, the marketing agreement can really benefit the host property primarily by putting your brand in front of consumers that are not inside the four walls of your property and therefore expanding your reach. So go back, listen to that foundational episode. And in today's interview, I'm going to focus much more on some of the objections that we hear uh, when we suggest pairing pouring rights with the marketing agreement, or at least elements of that in your negotiation. So without further ado, let's get to it. Here's part two of my interview with Rob Wade. So I can imagine someone is listening in and they're thinking, I hear what you're saying, Rob. I am not the NFL. I'm not the Olympics. I own 20 restaurants in a single state in the southeastern (laughs) region of the the U.S. Uh, How do I actually tap into the marketing or is that just is that is is that out of bounds for me? Do I just need to focus on the pouring rights only? How would you respond to that? And and. In all honesty, there is, there, every single account is important to them. Um, the business was built, as I mentioned, one, uh, you know, back, in the, back in the early days, it was one six-ounce serving at a time, right? And it was built in drugstores where a truck shows up and drops off you know, uh, five cases of product. And that's my, their, their core being, their, their fundamental uh, foundation of how the business was built was started from each of those each of those servings every single consumer has to be important to them the other the other point of it when we touch base on it you know uh, in the very beginning is the competitive landscape between these beverage companies is immeasurable um uh in fact there was many years ago coca-cola had the chance to buy pepsi and they decided not to (laughs) but if you look at if you look at the grand uh, scheme of things it's, it was probably better for the category, the business itself, that that, that that never happened. Because of the competitive nature, they both grew the category beyond what most people would consider anything that would have ever, would, would have ever existed like that. And, and, uh, and that's why, by the way, if you think about how many servings today the category represents, um, they both Coke and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper, uh, uh, they serve almost 5 billion people per day. That's like over half the world's population. 
That's how big the categories become. And part of the reason for that is because of the competitive nature of them wanting to make sure that they get their fair share of that of that consumer. So it's um, um, I would I would go back and say every single every single consumer that they can get access to, and go back going back to the internal activation um, point, if they can get to um, even a ten outlet restaurant chain, if they can get to those consumers for five years, six years, seven years, and have um, those those ten minute interactions without any competitor, there is a real value to them because they get the opportunity to build their brand. Be- and the reason why that's so important is that same consumer that might be in Super Duper Burger in in San Francisco, by the time they get home, they will have driven past a gas station or, or stopped at a Walmart or went to a movie theater where, where, there's, where the entire footprint of this beverage company exists. If they can build that brand preference in that, in that chain, uh, that's, that's, worth, that's worth a lot to them. And, so, and, that's, and that's part of what the value is. And our job is, is to make sure that that, that that brand value, you know, our client's brand value is, is elevated the, in the right way. I would say every account is important to them. It, it's a really interesting um, point, Rob, because you may be a smaller uh, restaurant chain or may have a property you don't think of yourself as having a marketing um, asset necessarily. But actually, if you're able to engage with the beverage company in a creative way and offer Coke or Pepsi or Dr. Pepper some even just you know a few seconds of exposure or a, a really creative way that fits within your brand to tie your experience and your product and, and what you stand for to their brands and even maybe an a, a, you know, organic brand or a juice brand or yeah. something new, then actually you've just taken, you may only sell you know, X number of cases, but if you can add that experiential piece on it, you're speaking Coke and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper's language at that point. Yes. You're, you're serving them and therefore it may not just be x cases it's x plus y marketing exposure now and you grow the value of the deal because it's a true partnership at that point yes and and let and let me give you another example as to why that's so valuable um think of think of what it cost last year i think a a, a commercial on the super bowl was like i don't know 5 million dollars for a 30 second spot Think of the consumer's experience on that in that thirty second spot. Let's say you're let let let's say you're Pepsi and you're wa- and you're looking and you're watching a brand Pepsi commercial sitting on your sofa, and you've got thirty seconds to engage that consumer. Now there's a value to that because you know you're there's brand imaging, there's things that are happening in their in their brain, but it's thirty seconds and it's over. If you walk into a in, into a restaurant, or if you're in a hospital, or if you're in an airport, airport's even a better example. You could be on a layover for an hour and a half, right? And you're and you're sitting uh, and you're waiting by the terminal, and you're waiting by your gate, and you're getting bombarded with images for an hour and a half. Now, what's the value of that? Those images with the consumer that can walk up and purchase that product. What are the brand images worth there, okay, versus a 30-second commercial or a billboard advertisement that you buzz by on Interstate 80? Um, the value of that consumer engagement inside um, a restaurant client or any client as far as that goes without your competitor mm-hmm. is a big value. And that's why yeah. there's, no, there's no such thing as too small. Yeah, I mean, I think about movie theaters instantly. I mean, they've figured this out. If yes. you're going, you're having fun at a movie theater, uh, before you you go and find your seat, what do you do? You stop by the concessions, you get a soda, and then you're slurping down the soda yeah. <laughs> while you're seeing the advertisements on the, on the trailers before the movie, and you're having a great time doing it. And they've just, you just have that experience um, with the soda and the movie for an hour, two right. hours, whatever it yeah. is. It does. It, it, there, there's something that you connect that positive experience to, uh, to that. When you get out of um, the language of just agreements and deals and contracts and start talking about partnerships too, um, I think we always encourage our clients to also not just think about what, what um, you, know, you can offer the beverage company, but what the beverage company can offer you. 
yeah. because as you as you mentioned, they've got partnerships in the local community nationally, whether it's the NFL, whether it's the local zoo, uh, whether it's um, you know the concert hall, but they could actually start bringing those assets together in your restaurant with your zoo or your hospital with um, with with another property that they have, they start tying these together in promotions. There could be some really interesting things that happen that benefits you as a property owner or you as a brand manager, correct? Yes. And by the way, uh, if you started to do the math on that, um, and we'll use restaurants as, as, an, as another example, there's a pretty high profit margin on those finished gallons, right? If we, c- if, if we can grow your sales by 4%, um, the comparison to what, we're, what we would save you coming in the back door is, is far greater, right? And that's part of, what we, that's part of what, what we want to do is when we're having conversations with, with Coke and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper and with our clients, it's, it's as much about what can we provide you on the, uh, on the uh, activation part of it um, and also on linking those, those assets. As I mentioned, uh, Pepsi and Coke and Dr. Pepper, they're everywhere. They have partnerships with virtually almost every business that's out there. How do they how do they take those same businesses and drive that foot traffic through the front door? It's really it, you know, we and we talked about how great they are at building brands. If you think about partnering with your beverage company, you 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 you're kind of hiring them to a degree. And so if you hire them, you want you want you want to tap into part of what they do best. And if there's one thing they know better than anything is how to get to consumers and how to build brand. You want that same muscle and that same resource working on your brand, on your concept, on your, on your establishment, on your business, because they are so good at doing that. Um, you just got to make sure you have the right conversations and to bring all of that, all of that energy is in, in, into that agreement because mm-hmm. you want foot traffic. Ultimately, you want your brand built by people that really know how to build brands. Mm. And that sometimes, sometimes that gets lost in the, uh, uh, in, in the, you know, in the interpretation of what we're negotiating, but it's always on our, it's always in, in, in our agreements. We want to make sure that, that, uh, addressing foot traffic uh, becomes a priority to make sure that your business is going to thrive with this partnership. So, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, I could imagine uh, someone listening in and thinking, gosh, I hear what you're saying, but I don't want my dining room. or I don't want my hospital. Or I don't want my airport looking like a NASCAR vehicle yeah. with advertising everywhere and a huge Coke or Pepsi billboard as you walk in. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Is that a valid fear or uh, do the beverage companies work through that with, with their partners? Yeah. I mean, marketing in, uh, in, most, in most cases is very specific, right? It has, to, it has to tie to your brand and what you're about. So, so for example, if you're, a, if you're a hospital, you may not want to see big red and blue coolers and billboards and all that stuff and by the way they assume that pepsi and coke and and dr pepper assume the same thing that's why they have evolved their businesses into better for you innovative products in fact they'll get aggressive on co-branding um images so that you're 100 percent comfortable on on exactly what brands are being promoted and the advantage again it goes back to if you're pepsico and you've built 22 $1 billion brands, you have a lot of options, right, mm. to promote uh, within, uh, within that internal activation strategy with any client. And, and by the way, in, mo- in most cases, it's not, it's not brand Pepsi and it's not Coke. It's, it's, it's all the other products that they have developed that they're also trying to develop um, internally. And so um, it, it gets very targeted as it should be. Um, and that's what they do. So it's really never, it's it's really never about you know quote unquote big soda because there's so much there's there's so much beyond that right now, um, and there's a value to them of getting access because they want to build those better for you brands. That's that's really what they're about. So it can be very targeted as it should be. Great, fantastic. And so if um, if you wanted to get started down this path in 
expanding from a pouring rights relationship into a true beverage marketing agreement. How does this get started? Would you advise a client to uh, to spend a little time dreaming up some potential ways that a, a beverage company, you know, could partner with the brand um, in a way that makes sense? I mean, is there a sales role for the custom the, the customer to actually bring to Coke and Pepsi to let them and, and Dr. Pepper to let them envision what could be possible? Or do you come with a blank slate and let Coke and Pepsi propose what that could look like? How would you get started? It really comes, it really comes down to educating the beverage supplier, the beverage company on your brand, on what's important to you, right? Okay. And, um, um, and, and also and, and, and selling your brand. Talk more to them about consumers, the number of consumers, how long a consumer interacts within your brand, Talk to them about those conversations, okay? This is not about a volume play. As, as, as I mentioned, they, they sell hundreds of thousands of millions of cases every single day, right? But they mm-hmm. built that business off of interacting in small ways. And mm-hmm. so what they really want to know is tell me about your brand. And then the, and the second thing is that I would make sure that that's important is because they sell brands so well, um, there, you know, you also have to make sure that that you are the center of the plate, meaning the client. Okay, um, beverage companies are going to come in. They're going to say, "Well, you have to have my brand because I have all this brand, you know, share recognition." But that's not really what 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 drives the business. Um, you want a partner that's going to come in and recognize who you are as the client. And that's part of, by the way, that's also part of what we do. We would make sure that your brand is elevated appropriately um, so that you get that, uh, that recognition in that investment strategy that would be so important. And ultimately, how the beverage company wins is if more, more f- uh, foot traffic comes through the front door, they're going to sell more product. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so the two go hand in hand. It's just making sure that those strategies are tied together. Got it. So from the customer standpoint, you do your job on educating the beverage company on your consumer, how they engage with your brand um, and the value that your brand can bring to uh, to their partners. And yeah. you let the beverage company then come back with which of their brands matches your demographics, which of their brand uh, uh, would fit your, your your moments and let them come up with some of the creative ideas of, of how their brand could actually elevate your Bingo. own business yep. and then you both win to your point yep. you get more consumers in the door get more passengers enjoying and purchasing more beverages right uh, they're going to have a better time at your airport or at your property uh and uh and you're going to get more money they're going to get more money so it's a win for everyone yep and that's and and that and that really summarizes it you know very well which is i don't care who you are what your brand is they have a strategy for it hmm. right and they know they know how how to how to engage that consumer um, for you and with you. Excellent, excellent. Well, this has been such a good conversation, Rob. Thanks so much for coming on and sharing uh, just the difference between pouring rights versus beverage marketing agreement. Uh, is there any last final thoughts that you would have uh, to leave with uh, the listener who's listening in right now? No. Yes, you know what I would say? I would say go back and listen to all of the podcasts, <laughs> okay? I mean, what a, you know, the it, and I, I mentioned this several times. I've been in the beverage business for over 30 years, but this team is so talented um, at Enliven. And whether it's um, Heather or Michael or Martin um, and, and the leadership, Mr. Harms yourself, I mean, it is uh, it is quite a model that really supports our clients in ways that, that that you can't even imagine, and 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 I've learned a lot just being a part of this um, this team um, over the last several months, and uh, it's been it's been educational to me. But what a value what a value uh, Enliven provides to clients. It's it's been a fun ride, really fun well, ride. Well, thanks, Rob. We did not pay him to say that. No. <laughs> you did not. You no. did not pay me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, we've uh, I've really appreciated it, and thanks. I feel like there's just a lot of knowledge here uh, that you've laid out. And uh, if any of this, if you want to learn more, you can just go to our website, enlivenllc.com, 
there's a, a place there to contact us. And uh, it's really fun for us to dream up of ways uh, that we don't just beat up Coke and Pepsi. We don't just try to get a good deal, but actually to create these, these win-win partnerships. Yeah. Um, that's, that's just our sweet spot. So we would love to connect and, and think about ways that, um, that a beverage company could benefit your brand and, and you could benefit the beverage company and, uh, and, uh, everyone, uh, wins at the end of the day. That's, and that's exactly what we do. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you everyone. Thanks Rob. Thank you. Thanks everyone for listening in. Hope you found that informative. If you have a burning question about your beverage negotiation or partnership, we'd love to hear from you and answer it on this podcast. Reach out to us by emailing podcast at enlivenpartnership.com. And hey, before we sign off, I want to remind you that you can take both the guesswork and the legwork out of your beverage partnership. You can level the playing field in your beverage negotiations. And you can save or make your company millions through a new or an improved beverage agreement. The first step is a free beverage opportunity analysis, which will tell you just how much you can save or you can make. Sign up for your free beverage opportunity analysis at enlivenpartnership.com and by clicking free savings estimate. On behalf of everyone here at Enliven, thanks for listening in.